It has been a, a rather strange uh, uh, legacy to me to have chased this movement since very, very early in my life. Um, Dr. Mihi was right. I started thinking about this because it was pressed upon me very early. Southern California, from the get-go, really became the mecca for the charismatic movement. It primarily developed here. And of course, Calvary Chapel developed here and has continued to flourish to the degree now that I don't know how many there are in Southern California, but somewhere between five and 600 Calvary Chapels, something like that. So it's, it's been around me all my ministry life. And that's not true with everyone. I, I recently uh, had an um, extensive three-day session with uh, some of the T4G guys, and uh, I, I wanted to talk to them about this issue. And part of the discussion was around the fact that they don't face this issue in their own ministry world. So they had to ask me why it's such a big issue and why it necessarily required the level of conference that we uh, put on with Strange Fire. If you are in the PCA, for example, the Presbyterian Church of America, it's not likely that you're fighting that movement. If you're in the Reformed Church of America, like Kevin DeYoung, it's a confessional kind of thing. They're cessationists by creed. They're cessationists by confession. Uh, even in the Southern Baptist Association, Al Mohler told me that issue is basically non-existent within the framework of the SBC. So they don't understand what it is to be in a, in a world of independence living in California, in the West, and having to cope with, with this at, at, at a sub, uh, really an epic level, and that's been going on for years and years. At the same time that I've been trying to address it, I haven't been able to slow down the movement. Uh, the, the movement has gone completely crazy, not only here, but globally. Um, we've been able maybe to help some people along the way escape from it or avoid it. But it has gained massive amount of momentum because when you appeal to people on any kind of visceral, emotional level, you'll always be able to draw people together. The, 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 the promise of the supernatural, as we were saying when we were going through John 6, is enough to lure people. Uh, and, and faking the delivery of the supernatural will definitely keep them there. Uh, they follow the crowd, attracting them with highly emotional music, and all of that has caused this movement to flourish, and not only here, but globally. So it was necessary, I felt, to... To, to really go after this movement in a great way. And uh, we, we succeeded in doing that. We, um, we made a lot of people angry. Um, if you look up Strange Fire on Amazon, you'll see the, uh, the reviews of the book Strange Fire divided between five star and one star. Uh, people either love it or hate it, uh, love me for doing it or hate me for doing it. Uh, it's a very divisive issue because you're calling into question people's spiritual life and perception and teaching and all of that in a, in a very extensive way. But nonetheless, it, it was the right thing to do. It, the Strange Fire Conference lanced a boil that was long overdue, needed to be lanced, and um, we're, we're grateful for doing it. And we all understand that truth must be exalted, uh, error must be uh, exposed, and that's really what we're all about. And this is about the protection of the flock. This is about not only teaching on a positive level, but warning people for what is destructive. Truth always divides, always divides, because it is separated from error. I mean, as the most obvious reality in the universe, there's truth and there's error, there's God and there's Satan, and those collide all the time. And we're all about the truth, and that means we're all about exposing error. So um, n n people's efforts to uh, sort of stop me or stall me by the threat of being divisive only spurs me on because it's it's obvious it's going to be divisive truth is always divisive it's part of guarding the flock so what we did i think um you know we we offered it up to the lord like you would any ministry as a as a sacrifice to him and we wait to see the full impact and the full effect the 12th chapter in the book which was a letter to my cessationist friends um, was a very important statement to make to help these people who have um, aided and abetted the movement by allowing for it 
to notice and carefully think about what they what they have been doing. I was very gratified uh, in the meeting I had with the guys at T4G who are the speakers uh, there, and I I was not speaking. I haven't spoken there. They uh, intimidated me into saying yes for the one coming up, and um, so I couldn't get out of it. But uh, they they essentially they essentially affirmed a cessationist position uh, w- with the comment that this is the this is the clearest and most convincing presentation of cessationism. One of them said to me that I've heard, um, and that's good. Uh, that's good. So you have confessional cessationists who are there already. And then you have those who are uh, cessationists because uh, of their understanding of the Word of God. So it was a very, very helpful time, and I was very encouraged by it. We, we need those people to take a stand on this so that we don't allow the acceptance of the non-cessationist view to be the default position for the next generation of evangelicals, which up to this point it's been. Nobody's saying anything about it till we spoke up, now others are starting to speak up, and it can no longer be the default position. Um, the, 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 they've had a default position in eschatology for a long time in the Young Restless Reform Movement, and it is whatever you want. That's, that's the eschatology default position. It's not important, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, you know, whatever you want is fine. It's completely open to grabs. And then they've had this default position in the area of the continuation of the gifts, which just allows for whatever view you want to take. Well, I don't think they can, they can have that anymore. We would like to think they can't be comfortable in a default position on eschatology, and that's why a few years ago I spoke on why every um, Calvinist has to be a premillennialist. I, I wanted to take away that as a default position, and we tried to do the same thing with Strange Fire. Uh, so far, my relationships with these people are intact, um, but they don't always tell me everything they think. But, um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the Lord continuing to use this. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of uh, things going on around it and after the conference. A lot of people writing um, in response. Most of it was heat without light. M- most of it was harangue without interpreting Scripture and dealing with the issues biblically. Uh, but where there has been any, any attempt to do that, we are engaged in answering that. And uh, part of the contribution to answering that was the reason we wanted to have the faculty series focus on that so we can take these great uh, studies that were presented to you in this series and put them in the journal and have some scholastic answers to these kinds of things that they're going to have to grapple with. Um, one of the one of the things that that I heard most was you paint with a broad brush, you put everybody in the same boat, uh, this is not fair. This was Michael Brown's criticism, and then he made five TV programs with Benny Hinn. So um, I, I don't know how you pull yourself away from the movement and say you've painted us all with a broad brush and then do five TV programs with Benny Hinn, because you've just identified with the worst of it. And that is precisely an illustration of what does happen in the movement. They, they don't know where the lines are. They don't want to draw the lines. They can't draw the lines because everybody has to be open to whatever the Holy Spirit in their mind wants to do. So thinking back over the movement, when I met with uh, these guys and when I've met with other people to kind of follow it up, um, th- there are several points that I've tried to make to sort of pull it all together. One is this, that the charismatic movement, I'll, I'll just kind of tag them uh, with a number and uh, go down the list. One is the realization that the charismatic movement is outside the historic stream of reform doctrine and history. It is outside. Um, I tried to illustrate that in the preaching class at the beginning of the year. Uh, some of you were in that class by, by saying... You're alive, and I'll just give you a brief kind of uh, summary of it, but you're alive at a time in in the history of the church when you've seen a massive revival of sound doctrine. Um, My dad was a a pastor uh, all my life. I was born into a pastor's house, and he was teaching and preaching the Word of God when he died in his early 90s, and that's all he ever knew. I engaged in discussions about the Word of God my entire life with my father. 
And I never had a conversation with my father ever about the doctrine of justification, about the nature of the atonement, or about the five points of Calvinism. The discussion didn't even exist. I grew up in a, in a world of evangelicalism where Reformed theology was non-existent where everybody virtually believed in provenient grace without identifying it as such, that is to say that every sinner has enough grace to believe according to his own will without divine intervention. I grew up in a kind of uh, cultural Christianity. We didn't even talk about those kinds of things. And then I got to seminary and I started for the first time on my own to read the Puritans and I began to understand theology in a different way. I started with reading um, Existence and Attributes of God with Stephen Charnock, and then I started reading B.B. Warfield, and then I started reading Thomas Watson, and this, is, th th this just changed my world. Uh, and, and then the reform movement started with J.I. Packer and R.C. Sproul, and it's gained momentum, and you're, you're living really in the greatest revival of sound doctrine in the history of the church. This outstrips the Reformation exponentially in terms of sheer volume of people exposed to the truth because of electronic media. I mean, you've got people sitting in rice paddies in Vietnam listening to what I preach here on a Sunday morning from the Word of God in their own language on a tiny little piece of equipment, electronic equipment. This is global. So if you're sitting around wondering when God's going to bring a revival, you're in the middle of it. Open your eyes. This revival of Reformed theology is sweeping, dominating. The conversation is all about that now. And again, I say, in all the years of ministering with my dad, I never had a conversation with him about this. It just wasn't in the conversation. I knew one small Calvinistic congregation, one small one, OPC church with about 30 Calvinists in it. That's all I ever knew about that. So th this is a sweeping recovery, and we can trace it all the way back to the apostles, right? You go all the way back, you go through, um, well, you know all the names, all the way back to the Reformation, back to the church fathers, uh, back to the apostles, and we understand that's our heritage. There's no charismatic movement in that heritage. If you want to look for people who believe that the, the gifts continued, you're going to end up with the Montanists. You're going to end up with the Zwickau prophets. You're going to end up with the Reformation crazies. There is, no, there is no history of this in that historic, reformed, sound doctrine movement. To, to find the roots of this, as we point out in the book, you've got to go back to crazy people who are the progenitors of a crazy person named Charles Fox Parham. And then there's William Seymour, and, and then there's Amy Simple McPherson and, and the rest. And you wind up with a charismatic church developing out of Amy and Chuck Smith. And Chuck Smith is a pastor in that movement. And a bunch of hippies come to his church, and uh, they, they start what's known as Calvary Chapel. And, and that's why you have a famous pastor in Calvary Chapel, one of their largest churches, saying that the Reformation is highly overrated because he has no connection to the Reformation. They trace their roots back to 1906 or 1898 or 97. So the first thing I try to point out when, when people ask me about this movement is this contemporary movement goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. It, that, that's as far back as you go. And if you try to trace it back and find people who behave like that in the past, you're going to end up with cultists or forms of paganism. You're not going to find this in the mainstream. A very important point. The second thing that I like to, to, to point out in helping people maybe get a, a, a sort of a broad picture on this is in order to support this movement, in order to support continuationism, you have to invent novel, creative, personal interpretations of texts that have historic interpretations that have been sustained and validated through the centuries. In other words, you've got to reinterpret passages of Scripture. You've got to tamper with passages of Scripture that have not been in question. And to do that, you come up with crazy interpretations of, for example, the, prophecies, uh, the prophecy around Agabus, 
such as Wayne Grudem does. You, you come up with simplistic statements such as, well, it, it says earnestly seek the gift, so that's what I do. And when somebody threw that at me in the meeting, I said, Rit, when did you offer your last animal sacrifice? Are you telling me that there aren't some things in Scripture, some commands that were for a place and time and are not universal? You can't, that's just over simple. You can't do that. So, not only is this movement outside the historic stream, and, it, and its progeny would be rejected, uh, all the people in that progeny would be rejected as heretics in their time, but it demands creative personal interpretation of long understood passages, and the burden of proof rests on them. I, I'm convinced that they are unconvincing interpretations. I believe people who hold to uh, non-cessationism or continuationism have an unmet burden of proof. It doesn't fly. And I also would add this, part of the second point. The things they claim that exist don't exist. Which is the because they don't exist. And that leads me to the third point, which is a, a really critical point. And many people haven't even thought about this. This, this is kind of a shock. You, you watch people's face when you, when you get them to this point, and that is this. That what they claim continues is nothing like what existed in the New Testament. So how does it continue? Uh, Dr. Mayhew came up with a new term for them, call them originists or something. I said, how about inventionists? Neither one of those works very well, Dick, honestly. But it's true, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it'll catch on. I don't think you'll see it on a t-shirt, which is the proof that it catches on. So what, what you've got is a complete redefinition. So think about it. You're outside the historic theology stream of the church in its purest, truest form. You have to come up with novel reinterpretations of passages that have never been in question. And thirdly, you are completely redefining the phenomena. And they will all say, well, we're not saying that uh, tongues is the same that it's actual languages being translated. We're not saying that the healings are like the healings of Jesus and the apostles. We're not saying that the prophecy is divine revelation infallible. We're not saying that. We're saying this is non-language. Uh, these are um, uh, healing something less than what Jesus and the apostles did, and this is fallible prophecy then you are not a continuationist. You are not. You are something else. You are an inventionist. You have just, out of the air, invented something. This requires a complete redefinition of the gifts. The other issue here is that those gifts were associated with the time of the apostles. Ephesians 2.20 is the key verse on this. They're the foundation. If the apostles are the foundation and the prophets are the foundation, then they no longer exist. If they no longer exist, then the signs of an apostle no longer exist. That makes sense. Speaking of that, all New Testament gifts were signs. So I was saying to one of these guys who were talking about it, I said, Okay, so tongues is some kind of, I don't know, gibberish. What is it a sign of? What is it a sign of? Because the New Testament says tongues are for a sign. So what's it a sign of? Of what? There's no answer. It's not a sign of anything. It, it doesn't point to anything. It is, it is incomprehensible. It has no meaning. It is meaningless, points to nothing. So in what sense is this a continuation of a sign that was designed to, to let Israel know 
that God was turning to the Gentiles. You know, one of the striking realities is that all the languages on the day of Pentecost, all of them were Gentile languages. Obviously, they were all Gentile languages. Do you understand that you got all these Jews coming from all over the world, coming into the city of Jerusalem uh, at Pentecost, and they had never heard God being praised in a Gentile language. Because back in wherever they came from, they didn't use a Gentile language to worship God. They worshiped God in Hebrew. They were hearing something that was bizarre. Speaking the wonderful works of God in a Gentile language was an unthinkable reality. Because even in the dispersion, they would praise God in the Hebrew language, the sacred language. This is a declaration that God is turning from an apostate, Christ-rejecting nation to the world. And here is the signal of that on the day of Pentecost. This is a sign that God is turning from unbelieving Israel to the Gentiles. Shocking. What was, the, what was the healing about? It was to identify the, the truth tellers, the true spokesmen for God, the apostles. Prophecies came through the spokesmen that God had ordained, pointing again to those who spoke the truth. So unless these things are the sign of an apostle or a prophet, they can't be what was in the New Testament. So in themselves, they're different. And no one can tell me what the purpose is. When I ask, for example, what, what is the purpose of a, of a, of a fallible prophecy? What, what's the point? Is God mumbling? He can't, he, he, he can't say what he means, or you have no means by which to figure out what he's trying to say? What is the point? Why, why would God reduce himself to something that's that indefinite? They have no answer. So, if you're going to completely ignore historic theology, if you're going to completely reinterpret passages of Scripture in order to accommodate the invention of things that have never existed since the apostolic age or ever, even then, because they are not the same thing, what you have is false. It's not legitimate. And I don't think there's any way around that. And that leads me to a fourth point, and it, it is this, and it has to do with prophecy. When you drastically alter the nature of prophecy, you really open the door for chaos. I could deal with the fake healings. I, I could deal with people you know, going in their closet and mumbling nonsense. That's not fatal. But when you start saying God is giving you revelation privately, you really do confound the singularity of Scripture. And that is a dangerous thing. And, he, and here's what's so interesting about it. We believe the Bible to be propositional revelation, right? Propositional revelation. In words. Propositional revelation in words. This new uh, prophecy of God speaking is not in words. Because this is what they say, this is what they tell me. Well, God gives you the impression, and the reason there's error is because somehow between the impression and your understanding of it, error comes in. So, this is God giving revelation that is nonverbal. Nonverbal. So, some sort of impression that you're trying to sort out. And they want to say where the, where the problem comes is because you, as a fallen person, can't quite articulate the impression in the way that God intended it to be articulated so that the prophecy was true, but you messed it up. Um, that, th that is beyond bizarre. That's not how inspiration worked, is it? 
because God spoke in unmistakable words. And they wrote them down exactly as God ordained for them to write them down. Those words were in their minds and then they were on the page. Actual words. And that's why a prophet was judged by the accuracy of of what he said, right? If you say, thus saith the Lord, and he didn't say that, you're dead. You get stoned. Now we have to accept some bizarre impression and hope that somehow this, this legitimate revelation of God doesn't get messed up when we try to verbalize it. Now, I will admit that the prophets didn't necessarily understand the meaning of the prophecies they received, but they got the prophecy right. First Peter 1, right? They looked at it to see what person, what time. They weren't unclear about the words. They were only unclear about the fulfillment, the significance. And I know that Peter says the things that Paul wrote are hard to understand, and, and sometimes people rest them. But, but it wasn't the words, it was the meaning of the words. So I think when you, when you allow for this gift of prophecy, you have invented a non-verbal kind of impressionistic communication from God that gets lost in translation. This is inconsistent with the precision of God and how He reveals His truth. And it wreaks havoc. It absolutely wreaks havoc in people's lives who buy into this and believe in it. Now, I think it's important for us to sometimes go back to the basics like inspiration, verbal inspiration, inerrancy, and all of that. Um, I think if we get into this loosey-goosey category people will lose hold of the necessary strong convictions about biblical inspiration and inerrancy and authority. I mean, that's coming already. Uh, Some of you saw the book Five Views of Inerrancy, in which the only correct one was the one written by Al Mohler. And and there were four who were playing with Michael Byrd, I know has probably had some influence or tried to on you, Van Hoyser and others are writing, diminishing the, the, the true view of biblical inerrancy. This just kind of works in this kind of system where you're allowing for God to speak in, in impressionist ways, in general ways, and that's kind of how there's this sort of, uh, uh, there's this sort of event where God speaks and we don't necessarily believe that they got it written down precisely word for word the way it happened, but we have basically the idea of the event there. So I think these are related. We have to fight that battle, uh, of the battle of inerrancy and prophecy. So next uh, March at the Shepherds Conference, we're going to do a summit conference. It's going to be a mega conference on inerrancy and the prophetic word. And uh, we have invited about 10 people to come and address the issue of inerrancy. We're going to come out swinging on inerrancy. That is what's going to define the Master Seminary. You're going to see new ads uh, on inerrancy. We're going to be the flagship seminary. We're going to put on a a campaign. You'll see the first new ads in the uh, brochure for the Shepherds Conference. But everybody we've invited to come has has said, um, I, I want to be there. I'll be there. Count me in unless something happens. And I mean, that's everybody from uh, Al Mohler, Ligon Duncan, uh, Ian Hamilton, um, who did that debate with Wayne Grudem, um, Kevin DeYoung, Carl Truman, everyone we've asked to come and take a stand on inerrancy and the prophetic word is going to be here for that conference. It's going to be a mega conference, so you'll be hearing more about it at Shepherd's Conference. We, we want to be the school that's locked down on the authority of Scripture and that it is the final witness of God's revelation, the final revelation of God. And then number five, another thing that I've talked about when I've had conversations with people on this is why would you give hard-earned um, and deserved 
credentials to such an unworthy movement. I want to say this to people who have spent their whole life earning credibility, who have been trustworthy. I had a conversation on one of the, the main guys who has uh, created uh, space for this movement. And I said, why are you doing this? I said, he said, well, you know, uh, you're not just writing me off altogether, are you? I said, no, no, I'm not writing. I'm thankful for, for most all of what you've done. So I have, I'm, I'm appealing to you. Drop this, I said. Drop it. Come on. Get off this ridiculous anomaly. Come on. Say, this is wrong. I changed my mind and, and join us. He just went silent for a minute. And then, then he sort of laughed. I said, yeah, it just doesn't work. It doesn't it make sense. Everything else you do is so sound. And, and then you come up with this stuff. Come on. Drop it. Let it go. Why would you spend your whole life earning credibility by the faithfulness and diligence of handling the Word of God and then open the door to this kind of crazy stuff? Now that, you know, credentials, really, uh, really, academic credentials, they're hard-earned. I mean, there are a lot of followers, but, but if, if you're there writing the theology and writing the books and being definitive and you've earned those credentials, you don't want to give them away easily. So I, I sort of appeal to the fact that they're... <laughs> they're, they're they're better. They should take some higher ground. One, one final comment, and then I'll, if you have a question, I'll, I'll kind of end that way. I've never seen a miracle. Never seen a miracle. Does God heal? Yeah. Does He respond to our prayers? He can do what He wants, but I've never seen a miracle. Never seen somebody in a wheelchair get out and walk. Never been to a funeral where the guy got out of the box, greeted everybody, and walked like he'd never been ill. I've never seen somebody lying in the hospital with terminal cancer hours before death be instantaneously healed and get out of the bed. I've never seen a miracle. I've never, I've never talked to anybody who's ever seen a miracle. I don't know anybody who's ever seen a miracle. I hear about things like that, uh, usually in some obscure foreign environment where they can't ever be validated or traced, but I've never seen a miracle. Through the years, I've, I've, I've spent lots of time in hospitals. I've seen it all. I've seen children on their deathbed. I've seen parents standing beside the bed praying for children with leukemia, and I've done the funeral of those children. I've never, ever seen anybody in a terminal situation that got up and walked out of the bed. I've never seen somebody without a leg all of a sudden have a leg. I've never seen a person congenitally blind uh, made to see because somebody prayed. I've never seen somebody congenitally deaf uh, instantaneously hear. I've, I, that's, that, I don't know anybody that's ever seen that. So a lot of this is just... It's just smoke and mirrors, wishful thinking. Have, uh, have I seen people who are diagnosed with diseases healed? Yes. But that's not the same because I, it, it could be a, a, a lot of factors. Uh, it could be that you know, the body's an amazing mechanism. It could be part of the medical thing. It could be part of the diet. It, 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 it could be the, bio, the body fighting things off, uh, all of that. When, when I talk about a miracle, I talk about an event which is only explicable by divine instantaneous intervention. I've never heard anybody burst out in a language they didn't know. And when somebody tells me the Lord told them something, I don't believe it. So I think just on its own, the movement falls short of being acceptable. I have been very encouraged to um, have these conversations because I've been able to get guys to affirm this who, who were already there. 
get guys to come to this conviction who weren't sure where they were. I mean, I'm talking about significant leaders and um, at the same time leave the ones who haven't seen the light a little less certain and maybe a little less likely to advocate this because it doesn't fly. And all of those are good. And this is not about me. I, these are people I love. Um, but I don't want anybody led astray, right? I mean, this is just part of being a pastor. I, I don't like it when false teachers prosper. I don't like it when people are lied to and deceived and given false promises. I always go back to the, and probably told you about this in the past, but uh, Church on the Way over here, we've lived in the shadow of that whole thing. And Jack Hayford resigned and appointed his son-in-law, Jack, uh, son-in-law, uh, Scott, to, to become the pastor there. And they had a, a laying on of hands uh, on a Wednesday night a few years back. I know Scott. And he was taking over the church. And a prophet, one of the Kansas City prophets came and uh, put his hands on him and declared that God had sent a message, a prophecy from heaven, that he was going to be the prophet of the world. He was going to do signs and wonders. That was going to have a global ministry. And on that Wednesday night, with the prophet's hands laid on him, he had a brain aneurysm and died. What is that? Recently, you probably saw uh, there's some kind of a conference called, is it Linger? Some kind of a Linger conference. Have you seen it on the Internet? Some kind of conference for these young people. And uh, some of the people that are holding that conference had invited a guy from the International House of Prayer, uh, Kansas City Prophets, to come and be a part of it because it's supposed to be about lingering, which is sort of waiting in a vacuum. You know, it's this contemplative prayer kind of thing. And so the Kansas City Prophets, you know, have that house of prayer where they, they pray all the time. It, it, it's very, very dangerous stuff and has been exposed in an article in uh, Rolling Stone magazine, one of my favorite reads. Uh, some of you may have seen the article on Rolling Stone magazine, but I don't, I don't know if you did. It's, a, it's, a, it's an article very well written about Tyler Deaton, who became a, a, a major kind of player in that uh, Kansas City uh, movement and uh, was uh, homosexual, and engaged in homosexual activities, married a girl, in a weird, bizarre thing, and after they were married, he was carrying on homosexual things, and other men were giving her drugs and raping her, and finally, uh, at, at his request, one of them put a bag over her head and murdered her. Okay, so now they have a murder on their hands in the, in the International House of Prayer, this bizarre thing. The article goes on to talk about homoerotic prayer, homoerotic prayer. This is so bizarre. And then I see this Linger conference, and I see one of the guys from that being there. So I send a link uh, to uh, Matt Chandler, who was connected somehow with that, and I said, you need to see this. And the next thing I know, that, that, I think that person's been removed. But th they've gotten away with, with all of this kind of uh, alliance because nobody has really exposed this kind of stuff. Um. One of the things in the article about the International House of Prayer said that there's a certain kind of music that goes on all the time. And the writer said that when the music stops, the people are disoriented. They are under such powerful mind control and manipulation that when you shut down the music, music is a huge issue in this movement. When you shut down the music, the people seem agitated and disoriented. It's all induced. to the point of homoerotic prayer, homosexual rings, people raping a girl and putting a bag over her head, a plastic bag, and murdering her. And this was a guy, Tyler Deaton, who was one of the leaders connected to that International House of Prayer. I'm not saying it's all like that, but I am saying they embrace each other. The International House of Prayer, Francis Chan is a keynote speaker there. He's the one who said, you know, he thinks Mike Bickle is great, the guy that runs that thing. 
They've had so many scandals through the years, you wonder how can he say this? So he drags whatever constituency he has in that direction, accepting that. Um, it's just very dangerous. You get dispossessed young people, somewhat alienated, somewhat lonely. You pull them into that kind of environment. It's very, very damaging. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of God, nothing to do with real prayer, nothing to do with real ministry, nothing really to do with with the Word of God, the advance of the Gospel. So I, I, I am concerned at the end of the day for the honor of the Lord and for the safety of people and that they would, they would find the truth and not some kind of deception. So um, I think we have five minutes. Anybody have a burning question? If you don't, that's okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> you never, you never, yeah, yeah, you, you, you don't want to try to rescue a group. You got to peel them off one at a time. You know that's what it is. You, you 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 can't attack them in that environment because you're outnumbered. So you you want to deal with people on an individual level. Uh, and that's gonna that's gonna take the, you know that's the that's the hard work of of ministry. Um, you know we we live in a soundbite world. But the real work of ministry is relational, and you got to take the time to do that. So I, I think I would find uh, maybe one of the family members that I'm very close to and spend some time. Um, and and the, the way I would approach it is that I, I love you and I'm concerned about the fact that you are assuming spiritual benefit from something that doesn't provide it and therefore substituting that for the very necessary source of spiritual benefit. I think you've got to get them out of the paradigm. And you start by saying... You know, are, are you struggling in your life? And, uh, it, the, you know, well, what's your spiritual life like? And what, what are you depending on to, to grow in Christ, to grow in grace? So I think you just, you have, to, you have to deal with people as individuals. I don't think standing up in the family and berating everybody gets you anything. But I, I think you, it's clear to them now where you are. And I think you just be Christ to that situation, be patient with them, be loving with them. They're doing it because they believe it. Somebody told them this, and that this is now part of their, their sort of habitual behavior. Uh, and it's going to take patience, and it's going to take time, and I, I, would, I would pick them off one at a time. James uh, encourages us to together. Sure. I think, I think the, the word that helps me is providence. I think God in His providence uses all kinds of means to do his work. And some of them might be supernatural, but that is different than a biblical apostolic miracle. Um, look, for every story about somebody that got well because the church prayed, there is a story about somebody in the Mormon church that got well because they prayed. And there is a story about the people who don't go to any church who got well who got over their problems, who had some kind of serendipitous thing come into their life and providentially help them. But those are, that, that's just life. I mean, we're, inter, we're, we're intersecting with all these powers, and uh, I mean, how can we sort that out? That's very different. Uh, I would say in the James passage, I believe, and I've written about that in the commentary, but I, I believe that's connected to sin uh, earlier in the passage. And spiritual weakness as a result of sin, where someone is so spiritually weak that they 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 really that they they really are unable to come before the Lord the way they should, and they go to the elders and they they feed on the strength of the elders who hold them up in prayer. And when the sin is dealt with, then the healing comes because it's a discipline, or maybe not necessarily a healing, but a, a spiritual weakness that turns into a physical weakness, like Psalm 51. You know, uh, moisture's dried up and, and all of those kinds of things. I think that's that kind of thing where you, you go to the elders and they pray. But we would honor that in the case of anyone. And we've had people through the years come regularly to our Sunday morning elder time and we prayed for them. I've never seen a miraculous healing. I've seen people come and then die. I've seen people come and get a little bit better and live a little longer. And I've seen all the various things. But again... Um, what James, I think, is talking about there in that context is people whose weakness is a result of sin. And, and he says, if you confess your sin. 
So there's some discipline going on there. There's some weakness in the life as a result of this sin. And, and the, the, the believer is unable to sort of rise above the, the, the spiritual weakness, rise above the, the, the suffering under the weight of this sin and need somebody to lift him up. It's like Galatians 6, bearing one another's burdens. So that's how I would see that. Uh, we have time for maybe that question in the back. Right, well, I have said that. You know, why, why are you where you are and not in a hospital? You know, and the, uh, the ultimate uh, testimony at the Strange Fire Conference was Johnny Erickson Tata. Because with all the healers in the world, you think if they all got together, they could get her out of that chair. They can't. They can't. She, she is a living rebuke to that entire deception. And I don't know why people don't see it. Because the, and I asked this question too. I told the guys when I was back in, in Louisville, I said, church on the way, five miles away, Grace Church here, why do we have 450 disabled people here that we minister to every week? Why are they here? Because nothing happened over there. <laughs> they, they, they rolled their wheelchairs here. What kind of testimony is that? So, anyway, I think maybe I should stop. <laughs> uh, there may be more to come on this um, as, uh, as we answer some of these things down the road. Uh, some of the Grace to You blogs and some other sources, uh, some of the guys on Cripplegate have dealt with this, and you'll see more of that as we try to answer the legitimate criticism. So, quick? Yeah, uh, Mr. Brown came out with a book, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, two two things. Uh, the book really doesn't deal with anything. It's it's just heat without a lot of light. Um, he wants always to debate on his terms. Phil Johnson tried that and didn't get a fair shake. He just steamrolled him because he's controlling the buttons on his radio program. Uh, this is not something you need to debate. I'm not going to debate this. Wayne Grudem tried to get me to debate him on this at Mark Driscoll's uh, whatever conference. I said, that's not going to happen. Absolutely not. I, I, I told Wayne that on one day. I said, Wayne, I'm not doing that. There's no way in the world I would do that. I wouldn't put myself in Driscoll's hands because I don't trust him. And this is not something you debate like that because it gives the illusion people understand the issue when they don't. This has to be decided with the hard work of working out the Word of God. I wouldn't do that. And I told him that. So he said, well, I'll call up Mark and tell him you're not going to do it. And I said, you call him and tell him I'm not going to do that. One day later, Driscoll sent out the public invitation to humiliate me when he had already been told that I wasn't going to do that. That was grandstanding on his part again. So I'm not, I'm not going to get caught in that trap. This is not something you, you, you turn into some kind of a sideshow discussion. Um, anyway, Dr. May is getting nervous. So here we go. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, it's been wonderful to be together and uh, just think these things through. Help us to be faithful at the same time, to be loving and gracious and in the way that we handle these things. And uh, bless our dear friends and brothers and co-laborers in the ministry who maybe aren't uh, clear on this. Help them, Lord. Help them to see the truth and reality. And uh, Lord, of all things, uh, we, pray that we, we pray that your word would be exalted even as your name is exalted and that nothing would diminish the singularity of your revealed word in Scripture. Make us faithful to that and to its truth, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.